All right, guys, we are back into the fray. We are on to game number two. This time, we are taking you over to Cursed Hollow. This, this is a map that requires even more macro control than Infernal Shrines, in my opinion, which and also could be heavily, you know, snowball-y, depending on how curses fall and if a boss is picked up during said curse. Yeah, definitely uh, an interesting map, in my opinion. Uh, it allows a lot of uh, potential ganks and free roaming um, that can be crucial to understanding whether or not the team's going to win. Yeah, and based off the last game, it's a little concerning about how it is played and if they'll have that capability to macro correctly for uh, cursed hollow so let's jump on into the draft now and this time around we have Raj and Mayev are going to be the bands for the game so Mayev not wanting to be tossed into the hands of uh, UCF death knights although I feel that Hanzo is the better pick anyways for Cursed Hollow. So I would be surprised, or wouldn't be surprised really, if Hanzo is not the first pick. I'm sure they're debating this currently. They want Hanzo. Ooh, they're going to take Blaze instead of the Hanzo. I think this gives UCF Death Knights lots of juicy choices. With every death comes honor. With honor. And like you guys said, the Hanzo comes out uh, well, well drafted by Death Knights, understanding the power of this character on this map. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm really surprised, and they're picking up Tahaka. So like normally, I I fall teams for picking up solo lanes really early, but you know who is in the solo lane, and that's going to be the Blaze. So even if you're not winning the lane, you can out rotate roll this battleground significantly better as the Haka than Blaze. Yeah, the Haka getting a few buffs recently. Um, namely to... I forgot the talent name, but he gets one essence per uh, tick of the swarm when it gets hits heroes. Yeah, it's the revised version that was hero takedowns only, which saw pretty much no, uh, no usage because of it doesn't help him in the lane at all, and so people would never never pick it up. Uh, pulling it up right now, the name, it's uh, Hero Stalker. So what's Thank you. interesting is if we look at like stats from uh, you know, Hot Slug, it's increased in popularity, Hero Stalker, and it's also higher win rate than One Who Collects. However, One Who Collects is significantly more popular still than... Um, hero stalker if we filter it down from master and diamond to only master it's almost the same win rate it, we're talking 0.2 percent difference and the other big thing i i suppose has gained a lot more play is tissue regeneration in comparison to enhanced agility you're seeing a lot more people pick it up than ever before and for good reason it helps significantly with sustain rate more popular across master and diamond highest win rate across master and diamond and uh, for master it's about break even with the win they'll go into tissue regen what do you think death knights is trying to go with with the dehika so i think they're opting for boss control with with taking out the junk rat uh, and no garage for him to throw people off and haunt them off the, the point. The Dahaka then gives them the ability to really put pressure in different lanes. And because the Haka would put the pressure in another lane, they will have to respond. And as soon as they respond to Dahaka, Dahaka can come and burrow in for a boss. Or if they start a boss, they can back off the boss, UCF Death Knights, and continue to let uh the haka just re-push a lane because if you pull all five members of team dynamics to come defend a boss just walk away like you don't even need to fight for it like 
let Tahaka continue to get value and free push it, much like we saw last game with Sonia, you know, uh, free pushing while five members of Team Dynamics tried to get some advantage out of that situation, which which they did manage, uh, thankfully, but it took him a little while. They have yet to grab a healer. Uh, I'm thinking Malfurion might be safe for them. Uh, they, they opt for the Rhaegar instead. So I agree. The Malf is really good. Uh, what I'm assuming they're going for is that Rhaegar has better clear. This allows Rhaegar to do the easies and Hanzo to do the hearts because Rhaegar can get through them uh, with his lightning shield. Not as fast as he used to back in the day, but nonetheless quick enough. And his ancestral will ensure someone like Hanzo doesn't get absolutely bullied to the point where he has to leave the fight. Now, his, his totem is also still good because with two tanky people, he can drop that healing totem and sit around while they get you know decent amount of healing out of it. Yeah, it can help uh, alleviate some of the mana problems that healers tend to fall into. Um, having that extra totem kind of gives Rhaegar a double heal, if you will. And if he plays it right, he'll be able to manage the uh, mana situation a lot better. Yep. So the final pickup here is going to be Thrall and Phoenix. It's interesting because they have now, they took out the Maiev potentially because they want to pick up a triple frontline. Essentially, I feel like they're, uh, they're running it back, if you will, to a certain degree. Like, you have triple frontline, we can play triple frontline. Enthrall with Crash Lightning, not having to be concerned about Maiev, we're getting in a lot of stacks here. Thrall is very impressive, and he's a force to be reckoned with when you're trying to just dive in with characters like uh, Blaze and Mirrodin. I'm um, expecting a lot of uh, damage coming out on the side of Team Dynamics. Yeah, and they definitely showed they can execute in terms of their DPS. There's, They just need to execute now their macro game. What I'm interested in is if they're going to do something crazy like have Phoenix in the top lane against Dahaka since he'll body him, or if they're going to stick with the Blaze in the top lane. Uh, the reason being is like Blaze will, will hold that lane and probably generally like push against the Haka. But in the final pickup, uh, it's the Terror of the Skies, a Medivh. So Death Knight's understanding that they have strategy on their side. They drafted a very well uh, team comp that's going to utilize rotations, map awareness, and just overall presence on the battlefield on the whole front. Yeah, I'm very worried for Team Dynamics because they, in order to kill a team with a Medivh, Medivh has to use a portal either aggressively or you you have enough CC to lock whoever is there down. Or if Stukov can get a good shove in this case, or even a flailing swipe to prevent him from getting to the portal in time, and the CC train follows, on, and, uh, follows up properly. And much like I was saying before, you can beat bosses because you have Dahaka. And with Medivh, literally he can watch if anyone's coming. So you bait the boss, let Dahaka free push, and then then disengage with a Medivh portal. All right. So we are kicking things off. This time we have... Mr. Freeze, once again on that Stukov, Raven X on the Phoenix, Captain Muramask on the Muradin, Summer Ash on that Blaze, Darabo on the Thrall, and that is going to be Team Dynamics. Blue side is played by UCF Death Knights. Dehaka being played by Kodiak. Snipe on that Hanzo. We also have Johanna being played by Roak Medivh. Can't really say right now. Red Conscript on the Rhaegar. And so we're going to see them rotate immediately to lanes. Like they're they're basically saying it doesn't matter. We're gonna we're gonna win these lanes. You guys can have the footsie battle in the mid, and we're gonna like get get uh 
you know, one up on you guys by clearing and trying to push into your towers. So, so Jaxter's on the Medivh, and he just went down bottom to try to deal with this Thrall that's going to be going solo lane on um, bottom lane, trying to push out as much soak as he can. Yeah, this is a losing fight for Jaxter. Like, he basically cannot clear this wave unless Darabo sits in it, which is exactly what he just did. Every time he sits in it, he helps Jaxter clear the wave. So really, Darabo needs to focus on one thing. Um, if you've ever watched cattle uh cattle has played through all in several occasions and it's like you know q stacks are life get echo of elements to 20 and that is your primary goal once you get it to 20 you can be cheeky do whatever you want but getting to 20 is how you actually win the lane and really is a huge power spike for him especially with follow through Early Bruiser camp being looked at by Team Dynamics. They want this early so they can get the pressure going on this map. Yeah, because they don't have... They have Blaze top lane who can hold his own. Uh, bot lane is fine, but their mid lane isn't as good. They have to deal with Hanzo, Rhaegar, and Johanna. All they have is really one good tool for, for clearing the waves. And with the night camps here, they'll be able to you know get a lot more pressure to alleviate it. Maybe even a kill if they can play this right on the Hanzo, as he seems to be still up front and poking away. So, for talents, we got uh, Winds of Celerity, so extra speed for that Mediv. He'll be able to get around the map much faster and rotate. Uh, we also have, we're actually going to see the full Stormbow build, it looks like here. Um, I got to say, I don't agree with this at all. Uh, this is like the. Not that it's a bad talent or a bad build, but this is the best map for serrated arrows in a scatter arrow build you get bosses like crazy you uh can bounce them around the objective super well not picking it up might be a critical mistake on the side of ucf then again yeah i totally agree yeah th then again they may deal with the combustion last game and and it went okay for them so blaze has got to make his way down but dehaka De Obviously, he never has to worry, as he can just brush stock his way. Yeah. This is where I was originally saying I thought they were going to do this, because with Snipe, he can he can delay it for a very long time. Redemption plus never outmatched at level 7, it's very easy to hold it. <gasps> Johanna, though, going to be Early caught pick. in the silence. There's a protected. Rook is still going to be going down, though. Nice multi-man route by Darabo. Uh, Darabo, though, there's the Q to keep him up. The portal, and there comes Jaxter on the back, but there's the counter kill onto Rhaegar. And Dahaka is now in here using his essence, and he's not going to be getting out of here. There's the tongue, but he's just pulling Mr. Freeze along with him. Oh, no extra kill, but this is great for Team Dynamics. They brought Dahaka down. They got themselves two kills. They're about to hit seven, and they got the tribute. Yeah, able to get two kills, only lost one tribute on their side, and they're running pretty right now. Yeah. This is... That was kind of the situation where I was saying Dahaka should always stay up here. Like, if the first tribute, give it up. Like, you get more value from having Dahaka push than taking the first tribute, in my opinion. Uh, especially. No, you're absolutely right. It's a good macro decision to do that, as it allows your team to power spike on the soak experience that he can provide. Yeah, and then it'll help with future tributes because if you take down the wall and potentially get the well, uh, future tributes mean they have no well to tap. A nice pickup though by Summer Ash to get those siege giants. They'll be able to put up some pressure. Jags are taking a lot of damage. Going to have to um, back on out for now. So. We almost have Echo of the Elements done. We are not going to get the follow through. We're going to get Ancestral Wrath instead, which is going to be pretty potent against Johanna. Also interesting is we have the enhanced agility, but now we got a fight breaking out for the tribute. There goes the Q from Raven, poking all around there. And now he's safely out of there. Snipe going to be using that natural agility to get on over the wall. Bro coming on in. A big condemned Darabo getting really low. Their Ancestral Wrath should be up. Rook is going to be going down. And he is the first kill. We have the Arcane completed by Medivh. So even if he does die, he is fine and dandy. Team Dynamics getting low in some case, in cases like Darabo almost looking like he was going down but they are the ones instead nuking down the health pools of a ucf 
Yeah, they definitely have the team fight advantage with their draft. Uh, I think uh, Death Knights is going to have to understand that they're just going to have to play the macro game a little bit more smoothly. Jaxter just sacrificing himself there. And Raven looking for the kill on Kodiaks. The isolation coming on... Oh, sorry, no isolation. The tongue, uh, same beginning animation. They're not even 10. But Raven picking up another kill. I mean, this is looking super good for Team Dynamics now. They get awarded with a boss. Um, I don't agree with Death Knight's trying to delay or stall that tribute. They should have just let it go and got right back to the lanes. Absolutely. They gave him two extra kills, which is going to make him hit level 10 uh, much earlier now, which means next tribute can theoretically be a 10 versus a 9 scenario. There's a stun onto Jaxer, the silence, and he will make it out, however. But Johanna, on the other hand, will not. Boss has been picked up, another kill, and this is running away into Team Dynamic's favor. And another pickup kill! Wow, Death Knight's not respecting the fact that they have all this pressure bottom and members are going down like a domino effect. They gotta regroup and understand that they just need to soak right now instead of giving them too many kills. Yeah, we have another tribute coming. Darabo should actually get that tribute. Um, I don't know where he's going. Like, there's the tribute. He should have been in position because this would have been a boss with tribute, you know, already. Uh, instead of, like, taking some shot, pot shots. This is really bad for UCF Death Knights. Tribute, boss, there's the big stun coming on out. Four members getting absolutely annihilated here. Rook's cake, and now the Kodiaks is going to be next. Snipe going to have to back on out. Two kills, boss still pushing. Stun onto Jaxter. Oh, sorry, not Jaxter. Onto Rhaegar. Red Conscript is down. Three members down, and they are still pushing onto this keep. Wow, Team Dynamics actually going to be looking at core right now, taking out key members of Death Knights. Can they defend? I think they have the potential to do so. And it actually looks like they're going to back out. I think they should have and could have postured, uh, postured for where that core. The reason I say that is, worst case scenario, they all die. And the, the result of it is going to be absolutely nothing lost, other than some of the curse and taking down front walls. You're probably going to get some damage on the core because you still have, you have Bunker available, you have Earthquake available, Avatar, uh, you have Massive Shove. And if you all die and take the core down, you know, to 70%, that just makes it that much easier to, to win the game. Team Dynamics backs up to, to do their boss. They understand that they have an advantage right now and they can get a ton of map pressure going yeah absolutely this is going to be insane map pressure going over some of the talents we got the polybomb the dragon's arrow the blessed shield the isolation and the ancestral healing but now they have to deal with a second boss and there is no four in the top lane which means that it's going to march onto this front wall they already have taken down the bottom so it, this is an interesting rotation they're going to rotate over into the bruiser camp and i like this because they have to deal with the boss they can get the bruisers and they can continue to siege the mid lane simultaneously yep good invasion and map awareness so understand that they can just take whatever they want right now as the enemy death knights need to deal with the boss they just acquired yeah, Polybomb is coming out, delaying it, and Jaxter is going to just avoid the stun of Summer Ash. They have the Night Camp here. Boss is still up there. Not going to get much more other than the wall. There oh! goes the Dragon's Arrow. Oh, EQ though. There's the Protected Purification Salvo coming on out, doing a ton of damage in the silence. And there is two members down. Make that the third. We got a triple baby as they are potentially able to end this game at this very moment. They're looking to do the core now. Or is slowly going down. Shields are down. Captain Murr taking a bunch of damage. Shove not being able to connect. Core is now down to 90% health and falling. But there goes Muradin. Polymorph coming out. But we have the Night Camp coming on in. Jacks are on the back trying to do his best. But I don't think it's going to be enough. 30% and falling. 20%. 10%. And Team Dynamics have run it back in very convi convincing fashion. In game number two, I got to say, like, if they look like they were getting spanked in game number one, 
this game number two show like team dynamics just made some critical mistakes like a few critical mistakes and this time around absolutely absolutely bodied ucf yeah knowing the map was just so uh, pivotal in allowing team dynamics to just say hey this is our map this is our playground this is our draft deal with it i like the draft though from death knights it seems like they had the soak potential just to push lanes but team dynamics just saying hey we're going all in we're bringing that hurt we're bringing the silences. We're bringing the thralls. We got this. And they got awarded heavily in multiple team fights. Yeah. I feel like the critical mistake was actually <laughs> this time around, UCF made all the wrong decisions. They, like you pointed out, overstayed for a tribute, feeding more kills into the side of Team Dynamics. Their Hanzo build was absolutely wrong for this map. Not that it's a bad build, it's absolutely wrong for this map. I think. 1 million percent of the time. Uh, there's not a universe I live in that if I saw this build that I wouldn't rage. Um, because quite frankly, this is the map with the most bosses, the most mercs, and that's where you get the most value out of those serrated arrows. Then now, you're, you are not wrong on that aspect. Um, just understanding the power of the scatter arrow and being able to burst down camps, bosses on this map is crucial. Yeah. And then when they had... Hakakam bottom, they gave up all that soak, then they fed another kill and lost any potential like recovery of the previous two deaths that they had. Sorry, um, actually, he didn't die there. Uh, they lost two, but they lost any potential recovery from having the Haka stay top, uh, which, yeah, once again was a critical mistake. And uh, they should have played this essentially like an ABBA game where the Haka is ABBA and you let Hanzo poke him down with the cues and the serrated arrows. As soon as like you guys have no more give, you you let them take it. And eventually you hit ten before team dynamics. You fight, you know, ten versus nine at that point, and you can start snowballing the game in your favor due to all the advantage that Haka has given you. Yeah, it was clear that uh, Death Knights put a lot of emphasis on trying to contest um the the tributes which ultimately cost them um multiple deaths uh they didn't respect the team fight advantage that uh dynamics brought when you know contesting those uh, tributes yeah the healing output difference is absolutely insane in this game like you can you can say a lot of this has to do with the combination that Medivh is shielding some damage uh but at the same time it's thirty thousand difference between stukov and Rhaegar in a 10 minute and 30 second game so you can see like how it just spirals out of control where red conscript died the most actually on his uh sorry second most on his team johanna the tankiest tank for potentially in the game who is obliterated five times that game and red conscript on the Rhaegar was taken out four times so you can't heal if you're always dead i guess like that's that's <laughs> we, we smart baby <laughs> Yeah, that was absolutely crazy. Um, I I gotta like definitely give congratulations to both teams playing their games and both both of them getting wins. Let me actually update that so people know that it was a one one draw series. Uh, but I gotta say like if Team Dynamics plays like this second game all the time, they are going to be on a tear the rest of the season. Yep, well played by both sides. Uh, very interesting how builds and talent choices can influence um, map objectives and pressure and lanes and just the macro overall. Yeah. I think another big problem we saw was, I was talking about it during the draft with the, the Medivh, which is if he uses it aggressive the portals that's how team dynamics can punish him and that's exactly what what happened he was using them aggressively to get people into the fight and several times they got severely punished for those aggressive portals if they had stuck to using portals as a disengage tool i've i've casted a game before where it was perhaps the most frustrating game for the the enemy team 
<laughs> Medivh would drop a portal. Team would be like, you know, one person would be almost nuked down to death. Medivh drops the portal, and that's the end of the fight. And they cannot get a single kill because despite having enough CC to lock someone down, it's not long enough to keep them from getting to the portal. That's all Jaxter needed to do. Drop portal, disengage, and r rinse and repeat. Like, no one should die with a Medivh ever in this comp, in my opinion. So you can have Jaxter, you know, you know poke him with a Q, Hanzo with the serrated arrows to delay, Paka pushing top, and you can call it a day, basically. Like, you could theoretically even have Johanna not even there and soaking a lane, get, like, double soak while you have two people there sitting and playing. I agree. All right, guys. That'll be it tonight uh, for myself and Energy.